to be building your own dream yacht. Paul is from Long Island and he's a pilot. His custom boat is Sirena 58. It's one of a kind blue water ocean going vessel. He made over 300 customizations to it. One of my favorites are hot tub and a stripper pole. But that's not the end of it. After the boat was delivered, he performed even more upgrades. Military grade security, monitoring, and tracking system that even factory couldn't do. Even his tender is tricked out more than most of the yacht. So Paul, tell me, what is that stripper pole thing out there? <laughs> You're getting right to that early. Well, it was just one of the fun little things I decided to put on a a beautiful yacht. I said, I wonder if they'll put a stripper pole on for me, but uh, they made me design it because they didn't want to have any responsibility for it. <laughs> somebody flying off the boat or anything. So I actually designed a floor plate. It's on the flybridge and I inverted a little coupling and put it underneath the floor so that it just, it's level with the teeth. And they made a beautiful silver uh, stainless steel cap for it. And then I took the pole and I designed, I actually had, I didn't know anything about stripper poles, obviously. So I actually went and researched the dimensions and how they, how tall they should be and everything else and talked to a few people at teach and stuff. And I, I gave them all the specifications in millimeters right down to the height, the width. And uh, I made a pole and it's a beautiful pilot stainless pole. And when I'm not using it, it's it just mounted on the flybridge railing so no one even knows it's there. And then when you want to use it, there's a little plug in, you unscrew a, a stainless steel cap in the flybridge, put it in, and uh, off you go. You can actually swing over the top of the flybridge and hang off the side of the boat. There's a on the other side, it's right up the uh, Serena's standard thing is they have a hot and cold running shower, a rain shower on the flybridge from the hard top. So you can actually run under, you can get wet and run under the shower, then do this. It's, I can put on a whole production. I've got stereo up there and everything. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so did, did someone already try it out? You know, I have not tried that out yet. I'm waiting for the special person. I haven't found the right person yet. So. Oh, you did. So you yourself. Uh, you know, you I'm have to see me on that poll. No, no. The few viewers I have would be gone in a minute, and nobody wants to see that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. What about the hot tub? Yeah, that was actually the very first, um, when I started talking with Serena, we'll get into how it all started, but when I started talking with Serena, um, they have a 64 version. They have a 58, it's the smallest one, then they have a 64. They just came out with an 88, which is a beautiful, beautiful boat. And uh, they're introducing a 70, I believe, this year. And uh, on the 64, it had a beautiful hot tub on it. And so the first thing I said was, well, I'd like to have that hot tub on mine. And my, their response was, your boat is not designed for a hot tub. Can't put a hot tub on it. And then, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not buying it without a hot tub. All right. <laughs> and so literally within three days, their engineers came through. They had CAD drawings and architectural things. They had to change some of the stringers to make, you know, make how to be obviously structurally uh, supporting for it. And it's actually the same hot tub that's on their 64. They just redesigned the uh, around surroundings of it so it's not quite as big around it, but the actual hot tub is the same hot tub. So they put that on there. It's a, it's a thing of beauty. So I fired that up the other day since it started getting a little cold just to try it out and make sure it worked well. So I was pretty happy with it. Well, I'm super excited to be talking to you because you are the first person whom I actually interview with a yacht. I did made an interview uh, with, with sailing people. I did uh, yesterday with um, William, who is on the cargo ship. Yeah, I did see that. You're my, so you're my first yacht. Like I, I perceive it as a luxury vessel. So I'm very excited to be talking to you about that. Well, thanks. And it's, you know, to be honest with you, it's all relative. Uh, when I was down in Miami, uh, where you are, I mean, if you look out your window, mine's, a, mine's basically a dinghy. So it's hey, don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> you know, I, it's everything I ever need, and you know I designed it. You know it, there was financial reasons and then operational because I'm pretty much a single operator, so I couldn't get it too big. Uh, both, like I said, financially would be too much, and then also just trying to handle it by myself would be too much. I didn't want to have a boat that I have to have a crew on, unless it was somebody that you know a friend of mine or something. So um, yeah, but it, it's all relative. I, I like. I think it's beautiful. It's it's the biggest thing I've ever had. But uh, I'm where I'm parked over at the Harbors Marina. I'm right next to the mega yacht slip, so it's, it's I'm in the shadow of the real yacht. So I have no delusions that it's a mega yacht, but it's it's a nice yacht for me. So, so I kind of jumped to the stripper pole and hot tub because that was like a hot items. <laughs> uh, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I, I mentioned that you are a pilot, but there is so much more information I know about you that I feel that's going to be interesting and kind of relevant. What is it, what is it to do with all the pilots 
going into boating. <laughs> well, it's funny. A lot of pilots do get into boating, and I don't know if it's uh, maybe it's disposable income or maybe it's the fact that they like. Most of them get into sail. A lot of they'll say pilots like sailing. Um, I'm not one of them. I, I mean, I understand the theory. Obviously, I know about airfoils and Bernoulli's theorem and all that stuff. But to me, sailing is a lot of work. Um, it's and it's a whole foreign language to me. If you were to talk about the rigging and and the halyards and all the other stuff, I understand what you're saying, but it is like trying to translate a foreign language. And so, it's not my thing. Uh, when I get on a boat, like you said, the reason I designed what I designed is. I've got satellite TV, I've got leather couches, I've got, you know, two barbecue grills. I've got, it, I want it to be like my home. I don't want to be rocking and rolling. I don't want to be, you know, on a healing to the side, the whole, it's just not for me. Uh, for some people, they love being off the grid. They love the wind being their propulsion. And that's, that's absolutely wonderful. I'm just, you know, I, I don't have a small carbon footprint. I burn gas, make noise, and <laughs> I'm probably the obnoxious one that everyone hates out there. And but, enjoy it. <laughs> It's, it's just what I like. I'm used to throttles. I'm used to going fast. I used to race cars. I've flown power paragliders. I've been flying since I was 14. I like uh, going fast and making noise. So. And you, what kind of pilot you are? I'm a pilot for FedEx. Uh, I started flying when I was 14. Just you know, uh, it was one of those things when you're a little kid. You want to be a fireman, a police officer, an astronaut, or you know. I, I went on a little introductory five hour flight lesson one day with my parents. And I came home and I said, hey, if I could pay for that, can I, because my parents didn't have the money to pay for my flying lesson or anything. And they laughed and like, yeah, sure, if you can do it. And I had a paper out. And uh, my paper out paid for, I couldn't even afford a full lesson every week. It paid for 45 minutes. So I started, when I was 14, I started taking, I went to the flight school and I said, hey, can't afford an hour, but will you give me a 45 minute lesson every week? And the guy said, sure. And I started flying. And you can't solo until you turn 16. So once I turned 16, I saw my 16th birthday. I went and got my medical for flying. I went and got my learner's permit to drive, soloed an airplane, and then drove home from the airport all in one day. So that was a big, that was my 16th birthday. It was a big Very day. cool story. Yeah. And then I just, uh, I've been flying literally my whole life. I started little airplanes, most of the day, and, and was lucky enough to get a job at Federal Express a long, long time ago. I've been there, I'm in my 30, just starting my 37th year, so a long time I've been there. I started when I was 12, so it was. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it was fun. I, you know, I love flying. It's something that, you know, for people that have been boating their whole life, it's second nature to them. And I will never, I've realized I will never get to that same level in boating that I am in flying because it's part of my DNA in flying. And I, I just know everything about it. The best I can hope for in boating is to be safe and uh, not be a nuisance to anybody else. And, you know, try to, I, I went through and I was in the Coast Guard Auxiliary for about five or six years. Uh, I have what they call, it's, they have what they call ops, ops qualified, which mm -hmm. is, their, they call it their PhD level. I've gone through all their uh, communications, navigation, training. I've got all that done. Um, I did go get my 25 ton master's license. And, uh, you know, and I've been using radar and navigation and charting and stuff my whole life. And so a lot of that is, is pretty second nature to me. But as far as, you know, I got a long ways to go with boat handling yet. So uh, I know my limitations. I'm not going to be doing anything too crazy. So. <laughs> Now, is this your first boat? Very first, yeah. It's very first. I've been on boats, but it's the first one I've owned. And I just, I'm that guy that doesn't, uh, to buy a small one that wasn't really everything I wanted wouldn't have given me the enjoyment uh, that I wanted for the work that I put in. So I said, you know what, I'll just wait until I have the time and the money to do what I want to do. And and that's what I did. And as like I said, I wasn't even planning on doing this. I was, because you shouldn't buy a new boat because, you know, the, 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 ex, the expense and the depreciation. So I knew that. And if you would ask me a few years ago, I would tell you, oh, you're crazy. Let somebody else do all that. But then someone came to me and said, hey, uh, how would you like us to design a one of a kind boat for you? Anything you want. And I'm like, yeah, well, I guess I better do this. <laughs> it was too, it was just too big an opportunity. First of all, nobody does custom designs a boat that size to that extent. Uh, Serena is, is a production manufacturer. They're not a one-off custom. They do have a lot of customizations, a lot more than most manufacturers do. Uh, in most places, it's well, what color do you want or, you know, maybe a few different things, but nothing really to this extent. But pretty much without very few limitations, they did almost anything I asked for uh, to the point where it was like, all right, you're pushing it. So they, uh, they, uh, I think I sort of pushed it past the limit that they had set for me, but... Well, for, for sure, it was a hot tub. <laughs> well, that, that was the worst thing. They probably thought, all right, after this, he's good. But then I even went more crazy after that. So. 
Well, so what is the name for it? I can see it on your T-shirt. Tell us a little bit about the name. Yeah, it was. I have a on my website. There is a, actually a little uh, video about why I named it what I did. And uh, I, I'm Italian, so I wanted to have an Italian name. That's so I was trying to. All right, what's Italian? And Serena in uh, in Italian means mermaid, which is where I got the idea for the mermaid logo. And then uh, Edenismo, I was thinking of what what could I do that you know? And Edenismo in Italian means hedonism. And for, for a lot of people, that word means a lot of different things. But if you, if you look it up in its purest form, it means the pursuit of pleasure. And I said, you know, that just, I mean, it's Italian, it's the pursuit of pleasure. And that's pretty much what I'm doing. I just want to go enjoy myself, have a great time. Uh, no drama, no problems. Uh, I'm not talking politics. I'm going to go and enjoy life. And that's how I came up with that. Very, very cool. Thank you. Now, next one. Let's talk more into details about the boat, right? What is it? Why you chose it? How? What do you have on it? What's special about it? Just full on about your boat. All right, you got about four hours. Let's see. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you the high spot. Uh, I, like I said, I, I was researching boating, and one of the scary things if you buy something new, whether you're building a house first or your first car, if you've never really owned one before, it's scary because lots of times you don't really know. Like you've been in boating and done things, you know already what you like and what you don't mm -hmm. like. So probably your third, fourth one down the road is the way to do it. I don't have that kind of time, and I didn't. Have, I just said, well, I'm going to do the best I can. So I did a lot of research, and I looked at boats. And if you would have talked to me a few years ago, I would have bet you a million dollars I was buying a used azimuth. I, I love azimuth boats. Uh, they're sexy looking Italian boats, and. Um, the 54 was a good compromise for me as far as size and what it would do. So that was what I was going to buy. And then I'm reading through my boating magazines, which I do every month. And I saw this ad from a company I'd never heard of called Serena. And somebody had written an article about their new, they just had one hull made and they did an interview about it. And when I looked at the boat, it was about the same size as what I was looking for, a little bit bigger, but it was a type of design I had never seen before. It's a semi-displacement hull which, um, you know, but for anybody who doesn't know what a semi-displacement hull is, uh, it, it'll, it has various ranges in it. It's not a full trawler. It's not a full plane boat. It has, depending on what you want to do, the boat idles just that idle at seven knots, which for a trawler, that's about all the trawler does. So I don't even have to crack the throttles. That boat will go seven knots, and it'll do it for 2,000 miles. So mm -hmm. if I just go a little bit faster and get it up on plane, it's on plane at about 11 knots, and it'll go about 1,000 miles. And then if you want to outrun weather, if you want to get somewhere before it closes or you want to do something, it'll do 25 knots. Uh, it'll, but it's not good. It's only going to have about a 300 mile range. We, we took it out on a sea trial yesterday and a full throttle about 2,300 RPMs does a little over 25 knots, but you're burning at probably about 60, 65 gallons an hour. So it starts where down at idle, it's burning 10 gallons an hour uh, idling around. So, uh, so it's a semi-displacement hull. So I like the idea of that. And then when I looked at it, um, if, you'll, if you've seen some pictures or you look at the walkthrough I have on the, uh, on the video, every area of the boat is set up for an entertainment area. If you go up on the bow, it's got a couch with a table and a hot tub and plenty of area to walk around. It's a beautiful area. If you're back in the cockpit, it's got, another, it's got a barbecue grill. It's got another table. Uh, it's got an aft galley. So if you open the doors and drop the window down, which was one of my designs that I saw on another boat, uh, it actually opens the whole boat into the cockpit. You've got a galley right there and stuff. Uh, if you go upstairs, it's got a flybridge that's probably one of the largest, if not the largest, in the class for that size boat. And again, you've got barbecue grill. You've got uh, I've got the back area set up for lounging. It can be set up as a, I've got it set up also as a gym. I've got pull-up bars. I've got weight bars. I've got uh, TRX bands. I've got yoga mats so you can work out up there. It's got a shower. Um, and then it's got a beautiful hard top with a retractable sunroof. So everything I looked at it, it was like, holy oh, man, that azimuth, and you, know, you can't go do any of those things. And, that, and, the az and very few boats, if people don't know about the European CE classes that they rate their boats, um, most boats, even if you look at a two or 300 foot super yacht, they're class B, which is not a bad thing, but class B means that you can go up to uh, 13 foot waves or you can go out in up to 40 knots of wind. That's all they're rated for. You know, it's not going to fall apart if you go a little more than that, but that's what they're rated for. Serena is one of the few Class A 
boats that I've ever seen, especially in that size. And it's, so it's rated, it's resin infused hull. The top is all carbon fiber. Um, when they design that boat, the windows, the doors, everything has to be able to take 30 foot waves crashing on it. You go out in 50 knot wind, it's gotta be able to hold together and real ocean going thing. So it's a true class A ocean going boat. You don't have it. Uh, some of the other captains I've had on there riding with me, I don't have the experience to compare it, but they say it's one of the most stable boats that they've ever been on. Uh, I do have a Sea Keeper gyro and zip wake stabilizers, but um, even without those, it's a very, very stable boat. One of the uh, magazine um, people that did a review of it made a little comment that when he got on the boat, there was a flower vase sitting in the saloon when he got on there. And then they went up and they did all these maneuvers and tr tried it. And he said, uh, I came back and he said, the flower vase was still there. He said, I assumed it was glued to the table. It was not. He goes, <laughs> it's, it was, it's a very, very stable. Uh, you turn the sea keeper on, even at anchor, the boat doesn't move. It doesn't rock. It's, it's, so that's what I mean. It's very, very comfortable. And then one of the biggest things I like, I looked at every boat that I tried to find in that size, and they're all pretty much three cabin layouts in that size. You have the regular master. You have the forward VIP, which is a little bit of a narrow, you know, VIP, but it's a little bit smaller, but you have that. And every boat has that third stateroom, and you have your two bunk beds in there, and or your two little twin beds. And I'm like, it's just me. On a boat that size, that's a lot of wasted space. I'm just going to be throwing things on top of the bed. I've asked manufacturers, I said, can you change that? Oh, no, can't change it. Can't be done. Serena actually had a two-cabin layout initially from the bar. I didn't even have to say, sure, we have a two-cabin layout. And one of the things I fell in love with it, it's got a vertical bow, so that makes a lot more. It increases the water line, which gives you a much more stable ride, but it makes that forward VIP as big as the master. It's a very beautiful, and it and the bed faces forward. So it's kind of unusual. And then the, what really sold me on it is you walk behind the bed and there's a little stairway that goes to a hatch on the bow. You go through that hatch, you're right on, you got your couch, your table, the hot tub. It's, I've never seen anything like it. So you could not disturb anybody else on the boat. You can go have your cup of coffee in the morning and sit there and read, whatever you want to do. It's like your own little, you know, balcony with the hot tub and stuff on it right off. I, when I saw that, I've never seen it on another boat. It's it just really they just it was designed by uh serena uses really really top line if if i didn't know the name but i did some research german frères is the gentleman who designed the, the hull and everything he's a world famous racing sailboat and yacht designer he's been doing it for years he's in his 60s i believe and he's he's the one that designed the whole uh everything they do you everybody that's come to work on my boat or look at it has complimented me on i go down in the engine room and how everything is put together. They use top quality materials. Um, they didn't, they just, they make sure it's put together really well. They don't, you know, everything they do is real. So once I saw all that, it was like, well, this is, I gotta try it. So, and I should have stopped with just, you know, it would have been out of the box. It's a beautiful boat. And I could have just made a few changes and been fine, but that's not how I'm wired. So I just went a little bit crazy. And it's like, well, I think I've read about this. We have to do that and we have to do this. and. So I started adding fuel polishers and water makers and water purifiers and voltage regulating transformers and every electronics. <laughs> I got FLIR, night vision cameras. You name and it. That's, and that's my actual, my, my next question. So when you, like you said, you did a lot of customizations and upgrades in it. Um, so my question is why? What are you planning to do on a boat? Are you planning to live aboard on it once you retire? What... What was the update and what was the reason for them? Let's, let's say that. Oh, I'll, I'll answer it in reverse. Just the, the, the real reason I did it was because my plan is, after, my original plan if I would have bought an azimuth would have been take a couple of years ago to the Bahamas, the Caribbean, maybe, you know, fly home every once in a while and just go use it as a little, little toy. Uh, this boat is designed to go around the world. That's what it's made for. Um, the only thing you can't do with it, because uh, it's still a power boat, is you can't, you know, I could cross the Pacific. You can go over the Atlantic. Take the northern route, make that. You're not going to cross the Pacific. It's three, four thousand mile legs, and you just can't can't do that. So, but so I came up with that. My first plan was a really crazy one. I there's a gentleman. If anybody's ever wants to see some other little reading, if, if you have uh, Prime Video, there's a gentleman from Tampa and uh, the two brothers, and it, it's called I Am Second. It's an eight episode documentary they did. Uh, they built one brother built a 21 foot flats boat. No superstructure, just a twenty, no keel, no nothing on it. And his brother went with him, 
and they took it from Tampa to Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, it's it's an amazing. You got to watch it because it's an amazing. I couldn't stop watching it. It's it's crazy how they lived. I don't even know. But I talked to one of the brothers and I told him what I was trying to do. And while I was on the phone, which was about a four hour conversation, he said, "I can design you a catamaran style fuel barge." He says it'll be two pontoons, no superstructure. It'll be able to flip over. It won't sink. He says I'll put a couple of trolling motors on it so you can do it. He said. So we came up with this plan where I could carry like 5,000 gallons of fuel in a barge and tow it behind me and try to cross the Pacific Ocean. And so I, this was what my original plan was, which is, in my retrospect, I was, I would have, you never would have seen me again. But I, told people, I said, I'm definitely going to be in the news either because of what I've accomplished or because they're looking for me in the Ocean somewhere because that's probably what would have happened. So luckily, about a year ago, uh, you can ship boats across the Pacific, or across the Atlantic all day. That's how my boat came across. But in the Pacific, it's pretty much you go to, you go to um, maybe Australia, you go to Singapore. Very few places will stop anywhere in, in between. I found one company that will ship my boat from either Fort Lauderdale or Martinique. Uh, they only do it once a year, and they'll ship it to Tahiti for me. So my plan is, as soon as I retire, is to go do the Bahamas, Caribbean, uh, no time frame, just whatever. If I find a place to stay, when I get down to Martinique, I'm going to find that window where they'll ship it over to Tahiti for me. And once it gets to Tahiti, then I can do on my own gas. I could do French Polynesia, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, and then either sink it, sell it, do it or something, and then come home because I'll be done. I'm thinking <laughs> five to seven years. So, uh, and then I'll be, I definitely don't want to sail, cruise it all the way back. Once I get there, I'll be done. And I'll say, you know what? I did it. Um, and then I just want to come home and I have a beautiful place on the beach and just go back and do the normal retired life and we'll have labor after. So that's the plan. So I know you have a daughter. And when you bought the boat or you told her that you bought the boat, did she think you a little crazy? No, you know, it's, it's really funny. And I don't, um, as well as I thought I knew my daughter, she had somewhere along the line, she found this love for boating and, uh, our fiance and then they have a small boat. They let, they have a small little lake place also up in Illinois. And uh, so they love boating, but she would, she's a, I'm very proud. She's a veterinary neurologist. She's a little friggin' she's a rocket scientist. I love her. She's uh, so smart. I don't know where she got the Marines from, but she's a really smart young lady. And um, she would give that up tomorrow. If she could go work as a crew in a little cabin on a, on a yacht somewhere and do that. She just loves boating. Um, so she thought it was an awesome idea. She's my biggest fan about it. She always asks questions. She was actually nice enough because when I had to bring it back from Miami after they did the work there, uh, since I have no friends, I had nobody to bring the boat back with me. So I was going to bring it back by myself. But considering, I, you know, it was the first time really driving the boat very much, you know, my daughter, I think she was trying to save me. She, actually, she doesn't have a lot of boating experience either. She flew in and took some time off from work. So her and I, it was a nice bonding experience. We spent four days. We made stops along the way, and we anchored out, and uh, we brought the boat back from Miami to uh, St. Pete, and we had a ball, and she just, she loved every minute of it. And to be honest, I wish her and her fiancé could come with me around the world, but obviously they have jobs and animals, and they can't just take off and go, but I would I would absolutely love if they could come with me. She's she's awesome on the boat. She's, she's great. Yeah. Very, very cool. Thank you. Next one is, what's going to be your first destination? More than likely, I mean, I'll do short trips just to get the boat sea child and, and dialed in. Uh, I'll probably start in the Bahamas where everybody goes. And from what I've heard, most of the people that go there, there's so many beautiful places. Um, I'm not going to go with any time frame. It's just going to be, obviously, there's visa limitations for how long you can stay in places. And then there's weather windows and things like that. So I'll let those influence me a little bit. Uh, but basically, if I go somewhere and I really like it, I'll stay. For a little while if i don't i'll just keep moving and so i'm just gonna do the bahamas and then work my way down the caribbean um how far south i go uh it's gonna depend on a lot of things when we get you know, get through the virus stuff and then i follow with one of the reasons we'll get into the security stuff i put on um it's not like i'm paranoid or anything but if you especially now what's going on in south america and venezuela and things there's you have to be prepared so you have to be careful where you go and there's a lot of places that uh, especially a yacht like that, it's going to be a target for, mm -hmm. oh, oh, there goes my, you know, life savings there. So, um, so I'm, it's going to be what the situation is at the time and how safe things are, where I go and what I do. So that will all factor into it. So talking about the security, 
Can we talk a little bit of that, or it's like secret stuff? No, it's not. I mean, it's. I mean, I won't go into every little detail. Uh, let's let's just say it's. Um, there's nothing like it. Um, as far I mean, I just I found a person that a lot of people, if they're familiar with the voting, they've heard of like systems called Ghost. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, Ghost mm -hmm. is a monitoring security system that supposedly is like a higher end one that most people are fairly familiar with. Um, there were some things I didn't like about it or how they did their business. So I, I did some more research and I found a guy named Nick Vallejo and him and his dad a few years back designed a company called Nautic Alert. And if you do some research on them, uh, it's just state of the art stuff that they're basically a father and son that got tired of the same problems with everybody else with monitoring and security. So they, they're, that's what they do. They sat down and said, let's design something from the ground up. And it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Even though I, have, I'll take, I don't want to bore people with a lot of stuff, but it's just like a typical bills like you'll have on your boat. What does it have? A little float switch. And it'll sit there and, you know, water gets in, the float switch goes up, turn, turns on, turns off. Very simple. That's it. Well, this one has, on each one of my bilge areas, it's an ultrasonic um, monitoring system that they build brackets and they suspend it above the bilges. And this thing constantly is reading. It'll read minute amounts of water. It can tell when the pump goes on, how long it runs. It keeps statistics on it. If it sells, if your pump's running too often or, or cycling too much, it sends you a signal. Uh, that's just a, and then it's all tied through the Iridium Go system. So I've got satellite. It's being monitored by satellite, 24 hours a day. Anything that happens on the boat, whether it's electrical, whether it's something in the bilges, whether it's security, it calls me. It'll send me messages. It could be anywhere in the world. It'll call me, tell me. Uh, I can make a list of people will say, hey, go check this out or whatever. So I can monitor the status of my boat from anywhere in the world. Right now, if I want to go see if the, uh, the bilge pump's running, what's my electric system doing, I can do that right through there. So that's their basic system. And then I added, I wanted to tie my security stuff in. So I talked to Nick and he said, yeah, we can do it. And I found one guy in uh, at RMK, Merrill Stevens in Miami. And he him and I sat down and I, he said, what do you want this thing to do? And I said, okay, I want sensors here. I want cameras here. I want this. And, and, and he designed I said, well, I can do it if you want to do it. So it's got uh, what they call a PLC system on it because it gets so complicated. It's actually got a computer system built into the boat. Its sole purpose is to move all the relays and stuff for when this goes on. Because I, I have little remote controls. I can push a button and make this go on, this go off. So the computer has to say, all right, when he does this, do that. And it, it took me weeks to just even program it. It's a programming thing. And so it's very sophisticated. I've got FLIR cameras all over the thing that basically, they're not just cameras. They they both put electronic walls up all around the boat. So if you, it's not like if a bird flies through, it's going to set off the security or anything. It can, it, it looks and says, is this a person? Is it an animal or whatever? And it has a computer built into it. it. It checks the heat signature, the size. And even if you stick your head in it, until a certain amount of your torso gets in there and it sees it's a real person, it won't trigger the alarm. So it tries to minimize uh, false alarms. And I can actually set up electronic walls literally right at the plane of the boat, right at the edges of it. So I'm not, if someone's walking down the dock or comes in a boat next to me, it's not falsely setting the alarm off and stuff. And then I've got police lights and sirens and... If you get on there and I don't want you to, and it goes off, your ears will start bleeding. It's uh, <laughs> the whole world will hear it. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, it was just it's got all kinds of. Every time something happened, I, re I read there's a Caribbean. You've probably seen a Caribbean security dot net something like that. It's it. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. It's a security. Uh, a lot of people use Noonsight, which is a good one that tells you what. But this other one is just, they monitor every reported activity all over the Caribbean. Uh, any thefts, break-ins, burglaries, assaults, and they put that all on there. So I, I get those reports, and when I would see something happen, I said, all right, well, how am I going to counteract that? Okay, well, how can I counteract that? And so I've got plans for pretty much anything. I, like a crazy example was I have a, on my dinghy, I have the same type of security system. It's got that same nautic alert system on that. That was my next question about the dinghy. Okay. <laughs> well, you don't have to talk. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> So I, I decided, obviously, if you have a dinghy, that's your car. Uh, you have to protect that, too. And so what happens is I'm not worried about it on the boat. When it's on the boat, it's chained down, and you're not going to get it off the boat. But and it's got. But when you go out to dinner or something or you go to the store, you, you chain the, the boat up. 
a lot of people use, you know, this little chain that they can just cut with a, a chain. So I studied all, I, I studied the, if, when you see the padlocks, one day we can do a whole video on the padlocks I put on these things. They're called <laughs> Abbas padlocks. They're from Norway. And uh, Apple, <laughs> the name, it's the name of the company. It, they are bigger than my hand. The shackle is a half an inch thick. And if you had a diamond tip angle grinder, it would take you 20 minutes just to cut through the shackle on the, on the lock, on the shackle. And then I have huge, like it's basically chain. It's it's square chain that you would use on truck tires. Uh, so very hard to cut through. Everything can be cut through if you want to, but you would have to sit there in an angle grinder for 20 minutes with sparks and noise. So no one's going to do that and try to steal your dinghy. So I'm there, okay, I'm safe. I can chain it up. I've got all the right tools. But then when I found, and then, you know, on, on most dinghies, what do they do? They have a little D-ring. So that's the weakest link. You know, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So at the factory, at the uh, RMK, I said, all right, this is not going to do it. They thought I was crazy. I had to make a huge, heavy gauge stainless steel bracket that went over the D-ring, and it welded with back plates and it mounted to the boat. You could hang the boat from the D-ring. You can't cut through it. You're not going to get through it. So, so the whole thing is nice and, and secure. But then one day I was reading one of these reports, and what I'm finding people are doing now is if yours is all chained up, they'll steal the one next to you, which is easy to steal. But before they leave, just to say, hey, screw you, they take their machete and they slice your tubes, just a randomize it. So I said, yeah, that can't happen. So that not about a six month. I, I don't, I, I look at things as uh, just, they're puzzles. Like, how can I solve this? I don't like, to, oh, I can't do it. You know, so I have, there's got to be a way. So I did research on, I said, surely police officers and people have fabric that, to protect them. I know I've read about it. And sure enough, I found a company in England that's called Cuttex Pro, and they make a line of fabrics that are made for police and security that if you have a knife, it the knife can't cut through it. It's to give you a little level of protection. But it only works so well. If you take a machete, a brand new machete, it's gonna cut, you know, it's gonna cut through it. So Honeywell makes a fabric called Spectra that does the same thing. So I got samples of these fabrics. And then I said, well, now let me see what I could do. And I found one person. I called all over the country. Nobody would, is a, you're crazy. We don't want to do it. It's too much time, too much. We're not doing it. I found one guy, and if anybody's interested in him, he's down in Miami also. He's, he's just, uh, he's like me. He's a little crazy. He run, he, It's his own business, but he loves what he does, and he likes a challenge. And when I told him about it, he goes, yeah, let's do this. And he, he did some experimenting and he lamin he found out if we laminated four layers of this stuff together, so you glue it all together. So the fibers, even if you tried to cut through one level, it couldn't get through the next. And it's, it was like a science project. But you can imagine four layers of laminated fabric, how hard that is to cut and sew all the seams. You imagine all the seams that it would take to cover a dinghy. He spent, I don't know how many hours, he had to come and make templates. And he did it, and he did very little. If you were to look at the dinghy, it looks like it came from the factory. He wrapped the into all the tubes. We deflated them. They wrapped underneath into the frame, so there's no seams. It's it's beautiful. And you can take a machete. You ain't puncturing those things. You can't do anything. So it, it, I thought it was a thing of beauty. And everyone said, "Wow, you'll sell a million. Well, I won't. I won't bore you with the price, but no one's gonna. It, you could buy another dinghy for what the caps cost, but how long is it gonna last? Did uh, did he tell you like what he thinks? Oh, the fabric? It should last for. I mean, it should, it, it, it'll it, outlast me. It'll definitely outlast me. So you don't think it's gonna delaminate? No, um, it's, it's it's all to. I mean, it's when you see this fabric, it's all, and then on top of that, he even put another layer of like a finishing fabric to make it look pretty. So because the Cuttex Pro is not that pretty. So he found he has another fabric that puts that he would put on there. Now, it'll, very interesting. It'll, it'll, it'll lot, it's going to last a lot more than the tubes would last on the actual thing. So yeah, no, it's 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 pretty. So and I you know it's it's like and that was like one day I read this article like all right so that was like six months of research and finding people and so this has been a, this has been going on for years and I just little things and like I said there's hundreds and hundreds of things I did and and said no oh, I want to try this or I want to try that. And, so just a little thing. How long, how long did it take you to do the boat and the dinghy, like to finish the project? Well, uh, I'm actually still doing a little stuff on it now, but um, the actual design of the boat from start from the time I, I said hello to these guys till the time we had, a, they said, look, we can't, today's the day you either sign and we can't change it anymore after this. That was about two years. And then the actual building of the boat was about nine months. 
uh, with some overtime, and then it then it takes about six weeks to ship it over. Um, so you we're talking almost three years from, and then when I got it, I brought it down to Miami to do the other work and that was supposed to be about six weeks and it wound up being five months. So I literally took time off from work and I moved down to Miami for five months. And, uh, I got, finally, it, it, I'd still be there, but I finally said, look, I gotta go. I can't take any more time off from work. I, and I gave him a date. I said, I'm leaving on this date. And uh, there's still some things I, I just, for the hot tub, it's nice, but you're not going to use it as a hot tub all the time. So again, it sounds like something really simple, but we designed a, it's like a plug that goes in the hot tub that makes it a sun pad. Mm. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but you got to be able to jump up and down on it. So it's got this special honeycomb material. It's got steel rods in it because it's got to be cut in half so you can separate it so you can lift it and it's not too heavy. And then I have to put cushions on it and stuff. And then I've got different types of backrests that plug in and out so you can sit up or lay down. And it was that alone, it was months just designing it and building it. I mean, as far as it sounds like, oh, I'm building a, but it was well, amazing. Nothing, nothing on the boat is easy or fast. No, that's well, it's, <laughs> If you look, anybody who knows anything about it, when they see the, if you look, one of the glaring things you'll see right on the front is this huge um, Carlisle and Finch searchlight. If anybody knows, Carlisle and Finch has been making searchlights since the beginning of time. Uh, if you look at any Navy ship, any Coast Guard ship, it's got a big Carlisle Finch on it. And I've got one of the ones that goes on the Coast Guard because it's 25 million candle power. It's like the sun. So if I turn on that searchlight, I can, <laughs> it, you know, I can see anything. So it's uh, just little things like that. I just, I said, you know, I'm going to could it, and they, again, they thought I was crazy because I had to build a special backing plate that had to be set into the fiberglass. They had to build, you know, it, it, you don't just screw it on. The thing weighs a ton and, you know. Um, so every little thing, which sounds simple, turned out to be a lot. Uh, they don't usually use, I put a whole lithium ion battery system in with a nice big inverter. I've got two big generators. I've got, you know, uh, fuel polishing systems. I even have, have solar? I'm sorry. Do you have solar? No, because, uh, mm -hmm. several reasons. One, for the amount of power I need, solar would be a drop in the, there's no way it would be a drop in the bucket. Um, and like I said, so. It's impractical to think I could, even with all the electric, it's a big 100 amp service on the boat. And even then I still have to monitor, I can't run everything at once because I just got too many, you know, it's got a, a lot of stuff on it. And oh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can't, even and you think about it, you run a big 220 volt hot tub, you've got a full kitchen, two big refrigerators, you got, you know, you've got so much on it to put a solar panel on there would be kind of a joke. It, would, it wouldn't, you know, it would light up, <laughs> it might light a light bulb downstairs. <laughs> But it, it wouldn't do anything for me. So um, I, I, I didn't even try to do anything efficient on it because it's not practical for that, for what I'm doing. Uh, there would have to be too many compromises. You know, it's got a big washer and dryer and it's got iron boards and iron irons. And uh, it, it's just not practical to try to run all that stuff on solar. Uh, maybe someday, but not anytime soon. So. Got it. Thank you. So my kind of last... One of the last questions, I know you have a vlog and yeah, it's called vlog right now, <laughs> not vlog, vlog on YouTube. So are you planning to continue on it when you're going to be travel? And if so, then what kind of internet are you using? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to, you got, there's some kind of an interesting solution about that. Well, that's the one thing for data. Unfortunately, um, out of all the technology we have in the world, uh, high speed data in the ocean is pretty much non existent. I, I looked into even the ones on, like, you've been, people have been on cruise ships or people that have been uh, on their own big yachts and stuff. The antennas you need for that, they're upwards of $100,000 just for the antenna. The data plans are anywhere from one to $5,000 a month, and the data rate is like old dial up speeds. It's like, you know, you're not getting any data. And so, it's really not practical to have high-speed satellite data yet. Uh, you've probably heard of um, uh, all the Star One. Starlink, uh, yes. Uh -huh. all Starlink and all. So there's like three or four of them that are trying to do that. But even that's going to be many years down the road. Uh, they've got to put literally almost a thousand satellites each up in the up in the air, and and it's it's going to be a different market. I think what they're trying to do is market it to resellers. And eventually, uh, maybe in our lifetime, we'll see that. But right now, we don't. 
So I did what the best I could do right now. I've got full, I've got satellite TV on there, and that's so uh, I can watch my new shows. Um, I have a Ridium Go satellite uh, with an external antenna and all that other stuff for, but that's mostly for like weather reports, for uh, text communications. I can make you know phone calls. Um, but as far as real data goes, your best bet is still being close to a cellular service. So I have a cellular booster. I have Wi-Fi built into the boat. So if you're near Wi-Fi or if you're near satellite or near a cellular, I have ways of getting that in onto the boat. But um, what is your booster? What is the company you're using? Oh boy, uh, you asked me a question. I would have to go and research to find out because it was one of those things. Initially, Serena put one on for me. Uh, when I got down to Miami and they looked at the system, the one that they had put on was it was basically something that they use a lot in Europe, but unfortunately um, it wasn't manageable for what I had. So we ripped that one out and we put a whole new one on with special antennas. And uh, if I heard the name, I I have so many things on there. I, I can't honestly tell you what it is right now. I could probably get uh, It's not way Wi-Fi? No, it's no. not. It's a, uh, it's, the gentleman that designed my whole security and electronic system, that's what he, he's, he knows this stuff. And he, he tells me it's the best thing that you can put out there. And I, I trusted him on all the other stuff. So it's, uh, uh, I have to assume it's, it's what it is. I have, you know, I, he put in so much stuff. Um, you know, I've got all those cameras are all, they're all channeled into video recorders that are recording 24 hours a day that I could tap into if I need someone, you know, if I need to read into that. I can set my chart plotter onto my big screen TV and my big screen TV onto my chart plotter. We've got an underwater camera in there that I can put up on the TV and watch the fish swim around the boat if I want to. And he's got so much stuff on this thing. And I love it because one good thing when I was in Miami, it, it was kind of heartbreaking. They spent the first two weeks when I got there. So I do have a small video about that also about don't scratch my boat, but they literally had to rip my whole boat apart. It was brand new. They came in and they drew diagrams of every panel, every light, and diagram, numbered and labeled every component, took everything down, wrapped it, and then put it in two storage rooms, and it sat there while, because they had open all the panels. They ran over a mile of wire just for the security system. Mm -hmm. So the good thing for me, though, even though it broke my heart to see him rip my boat apart, I got to see the guts of the boat. So in general, I have a better understanding than most people of where things are run, and but, you know, I'm is a lot of stuff and I'm still learning people because guys come on, well, where's this circuit breaker and where's that? And I'm like, all right, I think it's here. <laughs> and I think it's there. And I, I know most more than most owners, I think that would know if they just bought a boat, but it's, there's a lot of information. So, um, there's stuff everywhere on that boat. So <laughs> it's there's stuff everywhere. And like everything else, it's more things to break. And I, you know, it's, it's definitely not simple as better in my mind. It probably is on a boat. I'm just not wired that way. I have to do everything. You know, I have a phone that I can launch a rocket ship with. I've got a computer that does everything. And I probably don't do anything but, you know, watch videos or do some emails. I don't need all that, but I have it. And I don't need all the things that are on my boat. Um, but, you know, a few times, you know, if I'm in the fog somewhere and I've got this beautiful FLIR camera that I can see for miles through the fog, it's going to help me. Um, so everything I have is I've got the – I went with Ray Marine and I – for no other reason other than I did some research. I like them. I'm sure there's a million people out there that tell me why well, I should never go over Marine. A lot of people use Garmin. Everybody's got their own favorites. Uh, but I basically want, I stuck with one, so I figured they would all integrate better. And they have a thing called Clear Cruise, which has a super high definition camera on the front of my boat. And I can bring that on the chart. It's tied into the AIS. So when I bring that camera up and I'm on it, I'm following the chart plotter, anything that's in the water that's not water, it says, hey, look at this, look at that. It tells you if you're going to hit it, where it is, how fast you're going to get there. And if it's something like a boat with AIS, if it's a buoy, you touch the screen and it tells you everything you need to know about it. So it's got a brain. It, it monitors stuff for you. It'll give you alerts if you're going to hit something. Um, it's, so I, I've got a lot of stuff. Uh, do I know how to use it all perfectly yet? No. Uh, have I, used, I haven't even turned on some of the stuff yet, so I'll, I'll learn a little bit at a time. But it's there. Uh, I like technical stuff like that. And as I get going... And I get caught up right now. It's I'm so far behind. Uh, it's just there's, it's overwhelming how many things I have to learn and what to do, and uh, just the general maintenance on it already. Just sitting around is is a lot. So I'm so, I've been taking baby steps. It's hard when I'm working. Like tomorrow morning, four o'clock in the morning, I get up and I'm flying to Honolulu. 
So, you know, I'm gone for like five or six days. Then when I come back, guess what I'm doing? I'm running to the boat, make sure it's still floating. Then I can go clean out strainer baskets and clean this and fix that. Uh, so I, I'm pretty stretched pretty thin right now, but I'll get caught up. So do you do all the maintenance yourself? Well, uh, I'm, I'm definitely not a mechanic on any stretch of imagination. Uh, I also did, I probably got more tools than most professionals did. I, I, I'm still trying to find places to put everything and, and do it. Um, cause I realized that if you're out in, in the middle of nowhere, on um, nothing but a few islands and something breaks, even if I have to call somebody and say, you know, what wrench do I use and what do I, how do I do this? Uh, I'm going to have to be pretty self-sufficient. So I'm not, you know, I can do basic stuff with no problem. If it gets a little bit more serious, I'm going to need somebody to hold my hand or tell me what to do. But uh, luckily there's YouTube channels and things for doing stuff like that. So I wish I had half of William's uh, expertise, but I, unfortunately I don't. I wish that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not at that level. So I, you know, I watch the stuff that you guys do and I'm going, yeah, I don't think I could do that. So. And we, if we combined and you and William came with me, we would have to put that this stuff. So there you go. I'll even give you the I'm, I'm not a good dancer. I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can jump in the in the hot tub, but I'm not gonna dance in that pool. Oh, I'll give you the best on that so. <laughs> we'll have to find a dancer with us. <laughs> well, that was a, a a lot of information. I I'm gonna go and digest it. I'm sure I'm gonna go and rewatch this with William actually because there's so many I'm a little disappointed he gave the other guys a cameo I didn't even get a cameo appearance on mine. I'm a little disappointed but it's, I, I... he actually came once he's like do you want me to to talk and I'm like mm -mm. he's yeah. like okay <laughs> I know I don't shut up you probably didn't have a word in that get a word in his voice but I'm kind of hoping for I'm gonna I'm really disappointed I didn't get a cameo but that's all right I'll, I'll tell him I think he's talking there to someone <laughs> he, yeah he's talking to someone right there so he, he's mentally here. <laughs> okay. I think you guys are great. So I'm, I'm glad I found your channel too. So I'm looking forward to following your stuff. Too. So you're going to, when is the next video you're producing? You know, it's, I had thought I would have done a lot more by now, unfortunately, between COVID and the fact that I'm, uh, I'm like I said, the boat's kicking my butt a little bit more than I thought it was going to. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that the few people that have subscribed already are still hanging in there. Uh, it doesn't cut, you know, it's not hurting just to have it sit there. I'll, I'll get, get a notification when I put something. The real meat and the real great things probably won't start until I start traveling, which will be about a year. So I, it's going to be small little things. I may do a stripper pole episode or something. You <laughs> have to. You have to. I may do that, but uh, I, you know, it's it's going to be a little bit at a time when I when I can get it. But uh, it's there is it is uh, YouTube. Uh, forward slash it's serena underscore edinismo uh that's my that's my name on it but if you want to get the actual channel it's uh, mm -hmm. serena yeah, underscore, it. and then the name of the boat is edinismo that'll bring you up to the channel so got it got it okay. all right well it was my pleasure talking to you today thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your precious time now when you are in between your piloting and trying to <laughs> learn your new boat i i know how it is that's a so, lot of I hope my uh, video doesn't crash your whole website. I'm sure people are probably unsubscribing even as we speak, but that's right. That's right. No, I'm not subscribing. <laughs> so, so, I hope I didn't do any damage to your videos, but that's, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. So it's really nice to meet you guys. Thank you. And I, I maybe, maybe you're going to bring your boat to Miami again to do some more updates. Yeah, well, I don't know if it'll be for work, but I'm, wherever I start going, I'm going to be heading, I have to head that way anyway. And I may do uh, I may do a couple of short trips. I might go down to Key West or do something just if I can get away for a little while and do something like that anyway. So, uh, and you guys it works both ways. So if you're up around this area, feel free to stop in. I'd love to meet you guys. So. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of going to be hard to catch you because you're flying back and forth. Yeah, but I'm home some. Yeah, but I'm, I only it says I only work twelve days a month. It feels like I'm gone forever, but uh, but I'm you know the rest of the month I'm home. Like I get back from this trip on Monday, then I'm off for twelve days. So I'll be sitting on the boat going. Uh, I actually have someone coming because and I'm the kind of guy that likes to do it all himself. I, I like to wax it and do it, but I just don't have time. So I've got a nice guy. Uh, Cody is a guy that I know that does all this detailing and stuff. It's gonna, he's doing it by himself. It's going to take him two weeks, but uh, he's going to go detail the whole thing and give it a nice good wax job. Mm -hmm. By himself. Yeah, that, that's going to be a good two weeks of work. Yeah, it's a big job for one person. So I just want him to get the first coat on, then I'll take it from there after we – I'll do a little section at a time. <laughs> got it, got it. 
Well, I'm gonna go cook dinner for Mr. Hey, I do too. I you're, you're on. I don't care if you can dance. You gotta come. You don't care. <laughs> you can cook. We can fix stuff, and we'll just go places. That'll yeah, be. Yeah, happily, happily ever after. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn on, uh, turn off the broadcast. Thank you guys so much for watching Board Life Madness podcast. I see you in one of the upcoming Tuesdays. And if you are interested to learn more about Paul and his yacht Tyrena 58, please follow him on YouTube. Give us a like, comment below, and subscribe to the channel. Bye!